Welcome everyone to another Learning Rebels Coffee Chat. Super excited to have this conversation with everyone today. So here we are today talking about the potential of L&D, the good, the bad, the potential. And I'm really interested in everyone's story uh, first, but I'm also interested in where we go from here. You know, um, in the newsletter I sent out yesterday, I included the uh, LinkedIn workplace learning report for 2022. And there, there's a lot of potential, you know, so L&D has suddenly been thrust into the spotlight for a lot of organizations right now because of the skills shortage that we've been experiencing or that organizations have been experiencing throughout. And this is where we have those super special strong muscles right? Our muscles are for collaboration and for partnership and helping people be better at what they do. Those are our special talents. Those, those are our superpowers. And so now we have this opportunity to put those superpowers into the limelight and to take better advantage of them. So I really want to get into the conversation of the potential of what we do and how we can harness that better than what we currently do now. So let's start with this big question on the table, shall we? Is what changes have you seen in L&D throughout the course of the years? We can even go pre-pandemic and now, I think that there's been substantial changes within the, within the industry and what we do, even within this short period of, um, of 24 months. But I'm curious as to your thoughts, what do you think have been the changes in the industry that you've seen in two, five, 10 years? A lot more is done remotely than it used to be done and virtually. Um, and obviously pandemic accelerated uh, needing to have an appetite for learning being delivered, <clears throat> not face-to-face. -face. I mean, so that's a big change is even just the organization recognizing that learning does not need to occur only in a class face-to-face -face classroom and not as an event that it can also be parsed out in smaller bits that are in the flow of work um and again are not events they are part of they are parts along a journey right oh i agree i think remote work has we've all been preaching about how we could work remote and how courses, classes, programs can all be delivered virtually, you know, and now people are like, oh yeah, they can be. <laughs> so I, so I agree. That's been a big shift. What else are you seeing? Customization. Ooh, customization. All right. And, and well, customization and, and the use of, of technology, right? Even though it might be quote unquote antiquated technology, but like ditching 1970s videos for something that was at least, you know, in the 2000s, something as simple as that, that there is actually a crave for better as a, in a, in a, in a way. And it's not so much a check the box. Oh, hire this guy. They'll come in and they'll whip through a class for us, but, but more realistic to your special environment, because it's, it, it appears to many that it's more accessible than it used to be, even though it's always been accessible, they just failed to identify that those tools were, were there for the taken. Right, right. I agree with you. I think that there's a more of a focus on getting the right content in front of the right people. And I, I remember way back when, um, boy, I'll be dating myself with this. Did anybody else have the uh, CD content library? Uh, I see Deb shaking her head. Yes. And so it came in a binder and you had a subscription, almost like Netflix, you know, where you got TV in the mail for, um, for leadership or customer service or something like that. Yeah. I see lots of nods. And that was before we were really taking advantage of the internet. And we certainly before we had all of the ease of video tools that we have now, you know, where that was, that was the future back then. And so when you talk about 1970s training, Heather, learn on need and skills-based learning are pushing to the front of the line. Absolutely. And so would, would you guys agree with, with Heather on that, that skill-based learning certainly is taking a focus? What's your experience there? 
So I work at a hospital system. So everything we do is, uh, is skill-based at this point. Some of the other things that I've noticed, you know, you guys had mentioned technology, but kind of they're now finally starting to consider things like virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, all of that. So um, I think that's a great thing for my company. It'll be a while. Um, it wasn't until two years that they even knew that WebEx even existed. So we're going to give them time to adapt. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's baby steps. It's baby that, steps. Yeah. And that, and that skill, that skill training is huge in healthcare because people coming to us to work in clinical positions are not getting the skill training in school that they once did. From what I hear, that's the same in other industries too. People aren't arriving to work with the same skill base anymore. So now it's not only are you upskilling, but you're just level skilling <laughs> to start with. And then Oh, what a great phrase. <laughs> what a great phrase, level skilling. I, Shannon, write that down. I, I, because I think that that is, that's perfect. That you're, you're absolutely correct. And Quick, Jen, we, copyright that. Co- yeah, there we go. TM, man. It's like right, right there with your name on it. Thank God this meeting is cr- recorded. <laughs> that's right. It, it's in perpetuity now. That's right. <laughs> but I think you're right. And I think we could all agree that, especially if you think in the, in the business sector, you have a lot of what we might refer to as high potentials, you know, that come from university and they come straight into a business world and they don't know anything about business, right? So they went to university and they were taught, I don't know what they were taught, but they they were taught all sorts of things, but not business acumen, right? And not how to lead people and not how to be good, good customers for their own business, you know? So I agree. There's a certain amount of level set here that needs to be taken. And I think that's a great potential as well. The use of augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, well, that certainly wasn't something that was on our radars as, as early as five years ago. It is now. So what is your take on that? I think for my organization, it still takes a long time to get <clears throat> technologies on a roadmap for that to be supported. So while we may see <clears throat> some great tools that would make for wonderful experiences and the whole bit, it still needs to go through and still needs to be vetted as an investment. So I think that maybe the desire to have that exceeds selling or, you know, selling that into the business as a <laughs> worthwhile investment for us. We need to think in terms of like, what is the simplest solution that's going to get to the need? Um, <clears throat> and then it's much more iterative than it was in the past. And so because the pace of change is so fast and the amount of time that's available to even develop things is so compressed that sometimes the augmented reality and virtual reality and all those and artificial intelligence, at least there's the perception that it would take too long to create something that uses that as the solution. I'm all in on the AR VR, but man, the sell on that is, is man, it's like selling somebody a Maserati. It is so fascinating that, that, that technology is right there and so simple and so forward. And when your comment, Maureen, about, right, they want, they want this upgrade. They want this, right. Everything fine tuned or new, new, new. We know from building content from scratch or even taking old content and trying to readjust and relearn. And if you've got student materials, and that's a lot, right? Even if it's just minor stuff where recording a and taking some new pictures because something changed in the environment with that 360 camera and with the quality with a quality team. I mean, days versus months. I mean, it's it's exponential. I'm not promoting Zapper, but I I talk to those guys from time to time this year's super bowl is going to help uh change that that learning curve like they are already putting stuff together with like with peyton manning and um, i think it's uh cores light or whatever they're going to have little zapper things on their thing and so nice the super bowl and their commercials are going to help accelerate that learning curve to make that a much quote unquote norm thing so 
I'm, mm-hmm. I'm ready for them to help us out in that aspect. You don't need a degree in computer science like you might have used to. And you don't need a whole bunch of special equipment like you might have used to. And I think it's how we're communicating that to the business. You know, so if we are firm and not just with AR, VR, but with anything, if we have the courage of conviction presenting this in front of business leaders and saying easy, cost effective, and as you said, Douglas, truncating time from months to days. And I don't know of a business leader who wouldn't want that. So it's just a matter of how are we presenting that information, I believe. And that has been a huge shift in what L&D can bring to the table. We have this great opportunity, as I said at the beginning, of taking advantage of CEOs everywhere saying that their highest priority is the skills agenda, you know? And so I've seen reports that say L&D top priority, putting out compliance training. There's a, there's a real disconnect and we have this opportunity to get in front of business leaders and say, here's our superpower. We can help you with this skills agenda. We really can. A shift in L&D perspective here is the need to acknowledge and accommodate physical safety needs to be in place in order for psychological safety to exist. And I think the focus on psychological safety is another great shift that we've seen in recent years. What's your take on that? All of our classes had to go online and our instructors had to automatically become online instructors during the pandemic. And now when we call them back together, if we're doing training, for example, they don't know how, you know, we've, we've kind of forgotten how to be together in the same space and interact. And so with that comes those psychological safety issues that you have to create. I mean, there was always the, the concept of creating safety to participate. And it's now even more important because of that. The other thing I want to say is the most effective training I think I've delivered in the last few months, quite honestly, was just a series of drips about our performance appraisals. Mm -hmm. I never used to drip. That was just Mm -hmm. something that a faucet did. But um, drips have become a big thing for us, and they're very effective at the college. So the second part of that, the psychological safety part, I believe, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, um, inherently... As L&D professionals, we realize and understand the concept of psychological safety, and we, we try to incorporate that into our face-to-face classrooms, you know, by, by having them, you know, understand that this is a safe place for you to learn and a safe place for you to fail, et cetera. But now I believe that there's been really a dynamic shift in purposeful psychological safety, where we're really paying attention to it. You know, so what are your thoughts? Would you agree or, or not with that? I do see that, that people are saying this is super important, but I'm also like in larger organizations, I'm seeing like, like almost, almost like a a fight. Like everybody says it's important, but it feels like there's a lot of push and pull on how we deliver that to our folks. And I think that there's, I think that there's just a lot of ambiguity around what that really means and what an employee means when they say, I want this type of thing from my employer. And so from my role, like I might think it's one thing, but we're not part of HR, our in our org, our learning and development and HR teams sit in very different areas of the organization and so it just feels like we're running down what we think is going to provide this psychological safety to our folks but then what we're working on here seems to be in conflict with what hr is working on and so there's there just seems to be some ambiguity in general but yet i think everybody recognizes that it's important it's what we should be doing for our folks it's what we want to be doing. We just don't really know how exactly to do it and to do it cohesively and consistently. We're discovering that there are gaps, right? And there, there's more work that needs to be made. And maybe there's parts of the business that don't treat it the same way we do. And it's bubbled up, you know, and now it's really something that's like, oh, we could really work on this. 
how can we reach out to other areas of the business to really create a culture of accepting you know, the terms of psychological safety and really applying what that means across the organization. And I, I believe that the last couple of years has really led to us thinking more deeply about that concept. Yeah, so consider that I'm a Hispanic male veteran, okay? So I've been with uh, this health organization, the largest one in the United States for the last eight years or so. Prior to that, I came from uh, a law enforcement, you know, enforcement job that I had for about four years. Okay. And then before that, I worked for companies like Intel. Okay. Okay. So Intel's culture, they have this thing uh, that they call disagree and commit, you know, where you can be cordial, you can be, you know, psychologically safe or whatever, but you have to, you get to a point where a decision has to be made. And it may not be something you like. It may be something that you were adamantly against, but the idea being that you have to commit and move, you know, move the project forward at some point. Okay, so that seems to me at odds with psychological safety as I have experienced it. I will tell you that my first eight hours at my new job with the healthcare company eight years ago, they were the worst in my entire life. If ever I thought. Irby, you screwed up, except, you know, I would like to use like the F word, okay? It was bad. I would have gone back to the old job so fast if, I, if that opportunity had been there. And the thing is, I think that there's different degrees of psychological safety, all depending on the organization that you're with. In my present role, we couch what we're saying in this kind of, this kind of verbose phraseology that I think takes away from the urgency of the message. Okay, so, and by urgency, I mean, we get things done, but it takes a whole lot longer to get them done. You know, there's that phrase, you know, cut to the chase, right? If you can say, here's the data, this is what it's telling us, this is what our peers, you know, the organ other health organizations that we're doing, or that we're working with in, in the United States, this is where they're going. We need to get there too, if we're gonna serve, you know, our patients and so on. And so I get to retire next year. So I get to put all the psychological safety behind me, you know, and it's, it's kind of weird, but you know, I'm really into drones. And so I bought this the other day. It's my seventh drone. Okay. This particular one, unlike all the others, this one's called the Cinewoop. Okay. It has a really nice camera, right? But can you see these things on the, on the sides? It has bumpers. So this is a psychologically safe drone. It hits something and it bounces back. My other self, if they hit something, they crash and there's a lot of damage and stuff and it's expensive to fit. And so this is what I'm looking forward to doing going forward, is taking pictures of stuff with my psychologically safe drone. It isn't gonna get mad at me if I curse at it or if I say, you know what, perhaps that was a, the wrong thing to do. We should have done this. But I do agree that there's a balance. There's a balance between wanting to get business done and then trying to still take people's thoughts, opinions into consideration. So I think that there, there's a, a balance there. And it goes back to what, what Jody was saying is that, you know, there's, there's this push-pull that's happening. But I like that there's a push-pull happening because that means we have awareness of it. Some organizations handle that much better than others. Some care, some don't care. You know, so now our role as L&D people is to keep that balance, you know, and to behavior model and show what, what this means. What does psychological safety mean in your workplace, in your organization? that's going to help get business done, but still respect others. More organizations are hiring chief learning officers than ever before, you know, so the, and that goes along with uh, diversity officers. So those two things are going hand in hand. So that means that there's a building of awareness here. So now how can we harness that? That puts us in a position of being able to get a seat at the table, which is fantastic. We just have to make sure we don't waste it by saying yes to every 
training request we get that shouldn't be a training request. Like we need to quit saying, oh, sure, we'll build the training because Joey forgot to punch in on Monday. Because every time we do something that isn't going to give them what they want, then they're going to walk away going, we asked you to help us and you didn't really help, even though we gave them what they asked for. You know, if you sell somebody a convertible when they need a minivan, they're not going to be happy with the convertible. And we just keep doing that because we want to say yes, we want to do what people ask us, but we really have to make sure that we're providing value at the end of the day. And value is what's actually needed, not what's asked for. So if we think about better, you know, having a better understanding of the opportunities in front of us, one of which is connecting learning to business value to business impact. How are we going to take advantage of it? Well, we have to know what our business goals are. Oh, good. Yep. Absolutely. Do you know the business goals? Do you know the business KPIs, the key performing indicators? When was the last time you read your business's annual report? If it's a publicly held business, there's an annual report out there. Have you read it? One thing that's been super helpful in my role is just having connection meetings with different business units and just saying like, you know, hey, what are you guys working on? Like, where, where are your challenges? Where are your wins? Like, you know, and then as we have those conversations, number one, I've built that relationship with them before they come and ask for any piece of training. And then I can also say back to them when they're like, hey, we're really struggling with, you know, the number, we have so many agents calling in sick or unable to come to work because school's been canceled again, like whatever it is, we need to find a solution for getting that phone answered in a different way, right? then I can come to the table and say like, hey, are you open to us just, you know, putting some time on the calendar and maybe brainstorming some ideas? And then they're like, oh, yeah. And then we can throw out ideas that aren't training specific. Like we're not going to build an e-learning. We're not going to build, but we could say like, well, what if we, you know, maybe it makes sense instead of training them on this product first, we train them on this other one and a very short training and then provide resources for them so that we can get people through training and answering the calls faster. You know, so it just gives us that opportunity because we've built that relationship and they start to recognize that we have more value and we're actually there to help them. The experience that a social worker has watching the presentation may be completely different than what a psychologist sees or psychiatrist sees way above, I guess, at the, the CEO level. They they just say yes. They said, you know, if, if a physician tells you they need this training, you know what? Somebody out there has that condition. They need it. Those organizations, they have these very strict requirements on how training gets gets produced. And invariably, I haven't, I can't recall a time when I didn't have physicians or nurses or psychologists on the team who weren't adept at producing instruction. So I don't even, I don't even get to rubber stamp stuff because if they put it in the slide, if they put it in the script, you know, for a video, then it makes it onto the tape, you know? So I, I really, I really don't say no in my job. I would like to be innovative, you know, but when you're talking about research-based, these are some really smart people that have done the research and there's really nothing that I can add. You know, when we were talking about this chat in general, you know, you got the good, the bad, and the potential. Some of the bad is that Sometimes we have to go with subject matter experts. You know, you, you got to eat your broccoli at some point. And I'd like to, you know, shift, you know, the industry to where we are less about eating the broccoli, to keep with that analogy, and more towards having, you know, the things that we want, the things that we know that are really going to make a difference. Yeah, and whatever that means in your role within your organization, because that's going to mean something different for everyone. Now, the great part is understanding now that we can harness and take advantage of where, where we go. I thought, Maureen, you made a really good point here in the chat. We do a disservice to the business when we don't work collaboratively with all the different groups may have an impact on improving performance. And that goes nicely hand in hand with what Jody was saying. So Maureen, do you, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I can. I mean, I think it's just that, you know, even when we have a seat at the table and we say, this is what we're looking to improve and it's this metric and it may even be a KPI or something we can look at. The reality is that 
that the the learning or whatever we help towards that solution is only part of what's helping towards the solution. And so it does a disservice because if it doesn't move the needle because all of those other groups that were also going to impact performance didn't do anything, then I think it's still very easy to point it at that it was learning that dropped the ball over time and that you build like, you know, you have an example and you, and then you get other people to kind of be the advocates for like, oh, this is a great approach to take. We work together um, towards something. But yeah, it's like pulling teeth to get actual KPIs or even if you like, if it's like a tap into something where it's like, okay, well, you know, if there's like turnover, or there's an error rate, or, you know, it's like, even if they say there's a lot of help desk tickets, well, okay, so who can we speak to, to get a sense of like, what's happening at the help desk? Like how many inquiries are around this? Um, it's like, nobody wants to share that information. If you feel as though you're not getting um, the important information from your colleagues, then now what? I just think it's like communicating to and up the chain about what's happening or not happening so that at the end, it's that, you know, we all are, I don't know, we all have to work together. And then, and there are some teams where we do have like after action reviews to say like what worked, what didn't. In some groups though, there's more turnover. And so the people who were part of that have already moved on to something else. So because of the accolades they got for something, a project going well. They got promoted. <laughs> <laughs> I see your comment here, Irby. Absolutely. It, it is beginning with the end in mind, isn't it? It's if we, we start out talking business to business, then that's the conversations that end up happening. So if they come to us with a, a, a program request and we say, well, how is this going to impact the business? then they have no other choice but to have that conversation with you. When we start talking about creating training programs, assuming that the training program is what is needed, a lot of times we start with, well, okay, let's get down all of the learning objectives. Okay, Mr. Miss Business Sponsor, what learning objectives would you like to see? Totally the wrong question, right? The question here needs to be, okay, how is this training program going to help your department meet its goals? That's the question. So then, then, you're, then you have to have that business-oriented conversation, right? If every time that's what you ask, then you're sort of training the business sponsors to be prepared to answer that question when they come into your, when they come into your office. I remember um, ways back, I was working with a, a VP of sales and he came into my office and he asked me for something. I said, okay, how's this going to help your department meet its goals? He goes, I knew you were going to ask that question. And I'm like, great. Then come back when you have the answer off with you. And he was like, oh, okay. You know, so we could kind of train them to be prepared to answer those questions when they come to you. So I think that that's a big, important start that we can, that we can start with when we think about harnessing the potential of learning and development, going beyond uh, training program developers or PowerPoint designers or meeting organizers. The question that I always ask, you know, how is this gonna help your goals? But I, I always followed up with, well, what would happen if we don't do the training? And that, that, I was like, so if we don't do training, what's gonna happen is, in, and they don't, they never have a question for that. They just, they just want something because, you know, Timmy didn't know how to fill out his time card. Well, that's not my job. I can give you something when he first starts to show them process, but ultimately it comes down to how are your leaders engaging with their employees? And that's the, that is the, the crossroads I'm at with my, my organization right now is I can, I can push out it, all this training, everything, but I can't make people do what they're supposed to do. That's not, that's your job as the leader, not my job as the, the training manager. Well, and I think we're in a unique position right now in history for learning and development to really bring managers into the fold. You know, so how do we bring managers oh, on the ride with us? How do we get them on board with us? More so than we've ever had to in the past. Let's face it, 
in front of every good training program, in front of every good change initiative is a line manager saying, nope. So now how do we, how do we get them in? How do we activate them to be part of what we do? Because I think this is a great potential for L&D is to create that strength of partnership with line managers. How do we do that? It's a culture change for a lot of, for a lot of organizations is they have to start thinking that your job as the frontline leader is not just telling people what to do, it's making sure that they're working safely or that they're following through on what they're supposed to be doing, that there is some accountability for them and then their leaders holding them accountable for those things. So this, this top-down you know, effect is, you, know, you said, yeah, frontline leaders are like, uh, nope, I'm not doing that because that's not what I was like, no, that is what you're supposed to do as a leader. What other ideas? How, how else can we activate managers get them involved in the in the design process and in some cases have them actually become some of the facilitators of this right if it's somewhat of their idea and they're bought into it they have a vestment to make sure that it isn't a failure versus being just the obstinate young uh, obstinate child that's not right? my idea i won't do it right so what is your idea you're vested in this as much as I am more because this affects your day to day. Once I'm done with the project, I'm on to my next. Yeah. They, they really like when you bring them in and you say, well, you know, how, how would this best be communicated to your team? And they give you some ideas and they actually see that in the end product. And they're like, that was my idea. Yes. Look at that. You we're partners here. I'm not your evil, you know, overlord in the tower found that if I kind of start that way, when I meet with the managers or meet with the other departments and say, you know, my job is not just an instructional designer. It's not just a trainer, not just, I'm here to make you successful and your team successful, but we've got to be able to do that together. And so then we have these conversations. Does it work all the time? No, because there are some that are just like, Hey, I I just need to be able to check this box. Um, You know, they're getting used to in the past before I guess before me, um, they're used to being told yes. And they'll say, hey, you know, Timmy doesn't know how to clock in appropriately. And oh, all right, we'll put a lesson up there. Well, now I've started to kind of redirect and go, all right, so why isn't he? Let's talk about and and getting more things done and and getting to the root cause. You know, um, at least in healthcare, sometimes our history, at least with my company, our history is those people that are in learning and development right now with our company weren't in learning and development to begin with. Oh, you were a great bedside nurse. You've now gotten your master's. Let's put you in a learning role. Or, and, and so they didn't really understand that, that portion. Um, you know, I'm an anomaly because I went the other direction. I started in learning development, went to nursing school, became a nurse, and now I'm back in learning and development. <laughs> so I'm the weirdo that can speak both languages. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think they're starting to go, oh, yeah. I mean, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, we need learning on workplace violence. And you're like, hey, Joe, you just took that course in your annual e-learning two weeks ago. <laughs> That's how you know your stuff's not working. <laughs> yes. And so yes. I save those examples. And I use those oh. examples when I have those meetings going, hey, let me explain to you what checking the box does. Here's an example. I love that. That's a great idea. And, and that's, that's helping to bring them along. Again, doesn't work 100% of the time, but they're getting there. Right. But it's good anecdotal yeah. type of data. And for the most part, they're more, they're more responsive to anecdotal, um, at least some of the departments I've been working with lately. Now, if I'm working with finance, then I got to go numbers. I got to right. go data. I got to. Right. <laughs> but if I'm working with quality or a nursing unit or something like that, then I can go anecdotal and it makes more sense to them. Mm -hmm. Sure, because you're speaking a language. Is important too. The big question is, why aren't people doing the thing we want them to do or that they need to do? So rather than going in and saying, well, here's a training program, it's like, well, why aren't they doing it in the first place? And I think also when we think about the movement of L&D through the years 
And I saw Irby's comment in there about shifting even the job title from instructional designer to design thinking. Sometimes that makes a big difference in organizations because I, Irby, your comment was spot on about sometimes people think instructional designers and you think teachers, you know, uh, that, so they automatically kind of put you into that box. Uh, but I do think that there's been a big shift in attitudes behind what a learning and development person can do for an organization. And just changing the way that we have these conversations and changing our vocabulary use and how we present data to people, like Jen said, I think that that's a great shift that I've seen that we are all making. And so now those are great ways to be able to activate managers, bring them in earlier. That's what I'm hearing from you guys is that you bring them in or keep them in. Uh, I used to do steering committees and so a steering committee rotated every quarter. So there'd be different per people on the committee. So you'd have a business leader, a manager, line managers, end users were all part of this steering committee and you meet with them you know, every few weeks or once a month just to kind of sense check the priorities of the organization. And say, what do you guys think of this? The, the, this is what training is working on right now. Do you think this is really a priority or not? Or why, how do you think this is gonna make a business impact? And so everybody's voices from different areas of the business was heard. I'm looking at Jody's comment. One question I have added when learning more about business needs my team create. How often is that happening? What data do you have to show? How often are your team members not logging in? Right, so you're asking them for data. Show me the data, because in essence, what you're asking there is show me the proof that you need this training, although that's not what you're saying. Right. It really comes down to a perception, right? Like I manage a team. I have one employee that is horrible at logging in. That is a management issue, not a training issue. <laughs> right. The employers worked for the company for six years, seven years now, not a training issue. They know how to do the job. And so I know that. So when another manager comes to me and says, hey, my employees aren't logging in, I can say to them, like, well, what data do you have? Like, is this is this a widespread issue or is it one employee? You know, and then they start to recognize where I'm going with that, right? Oh, it's just Timmy. Oh, well, have you talked to Timmy yet? Like, maybe, you know. We do have this pan, like this this course, like if you want to show it to Timmy because you think Timmy doesn't remember, like here it's out there, like that he learned it on day one. Like first thing HR taught him was how to clock in. Um, but I just have really, really pushed back on that because I have too many asks on my desk. I can't say yes to everything. Um, and so Irby, I'm glad that you can. Um, but I'm not in a position to say yes to everything. And so I have to really pick and choose where, where we spend our time and can add the most, most, oh, I love that if his life depended on it. I, um, I asked that question too, Maureen. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. And as, as the priorities for L and D grow, and as we become more involved in the business and we talk about seat at the table. And yes, we, we need to seat at the table. And I wish we had bigger voices when it came to the seat at the table. But for me, it's not asking for a seat at the table. It's just about grabbing the chair. Just grabbing the chair and do something. You know, don't, don't wait for people to ask you to join them. You know, this is, we, this is why we're all learning rebels here, right? You know, so we are going to grab the chair. We're going to have a seat. We're going to do the things that, is important for our business and for our organizations. And so while having a seat at the table is a good goal to have, I say, just do it, do what you can, do what you can. And it's baby steps, right? You don't have to do big things. You can do small things like changing the questions we ask. That's a small thing to do. So this leads me to the last part of this, which is, you know, upskilling ourselves. What are we doing to make ourselves as current as we possibly can be, to have the right conversations, to keeping in the know in our own professional development? Part of that LinkedIn report said that on the average, L&D people spend 23% less time upskilling themselves 
than other people in their organization. So we are not particularly good behavior models. That was, that made my eyes go like this when I read that in the report. So we need to do better at upskilling ourselves and finding time. So how are we going to do that, people? One answer, I'm going to be here every other Friday. Okay, there's one. <laughs> okay, what else are you? I uh, just put it in the chat, Shannon. Yeah, stuff okay. like stuff like these collaborative things, right? So it's it's. I mean, this is in essence a a version of a burst learning for us, right? Right, caring and sharing and and moving on, right? Yep, absolutely. Shared experiences. We all learn from that. But other than plugging my stuff, what is it that you guys can? What can you do? What do you do? I do ATD every year okay I mean, so you go you go to the you go to the conference every year international conference even even when i was self-employed and had you know basically paying for it out of my own pocket it's just that critical to my credibility in this profession and i read the magazine you know and i get to know the leaders in in the profession and that increases my wisdom and I've been in this business a long, long time, and everything I've done has led me to this point where my wisdom is, is what I share with people, and then I can help them see why something won't work, or have you thought about this, or here's going to be the ramifications of that, and it gets so wrapped up into OD as well, and so that's become my world now. It's, it's, it's very tied. I love but, that, Deb. You and I, yes, I see you. I used to do yeah. the same. Well, I do the same thing now. I mean, I, I'm in oh, my own business. So whenever I go to ATD and if I'm not speaking, I've got, to, I've got to pay for that out of my own pocket. And it's the one conference a year that I will happily pay out of my own pocket. To same way. It's you know? just yeah. that valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Shannon, I, I'd just like to share something to it, you know. Nine years ago, when I was working in New Mexico, of all places, you know, near Carlsbad, Carlsbad's caverns, you know, not a whole lot of chances for PD there. But I looked at I looked at my job. I was in like 20 years, you know, doing it for at that time. And you know what I found that was lacking in my career? I wasn't having fun. I was really good at what I did. You know, it's almost like I was like at a knife edge. And, you know, I found out about this thing that K-12 teachers have called Ed Camp. You know where it's a it's an it's an unconference where you go there, and what ends up being on the agenda is you look at the skills and knowledge, the know how that people bring to the event, and then what the needs are, and then you you know the eighty twenty rule you know develop the, the the agenda right there, and you know I have it's rare now that I go to an industry event. I think I'm going to go to Devlin in you know, the next month. I think my boss wants me to go. But for the most part, I learn alongside kids, you know, basically, you know, next in two weeks, I'm going to be in Texas learning how to be a teacher's aide. You know, you talk about servant leadership, you know, being, you know, helping people. Yeah. And so, again, I, does it have to do directly with L&D? No. Does, can it apply? Yeah. Yeah. Now that we're at the top of the hour, here's what I'd like you guys to do is to share with me, let's leave this on a really positive and a really high note. What I'd like to know is why are you in this profession? What do you love about what you do? I like helping people help themselves and get better. There is some, some uh, what's that, inner glory, I guess, seeing people be able to get better at what they need to do. Yes, I agree. Me too. What else? So I do a lot of internal education and also external customer education. And so for me, it's really creating, like making other people's jobs the best it can be. So making them just great at their job, whether that's here at my company or at the companies that use our software. So love that. Excellent. Deb, what do you love about the industry? What do you love about what you do? Oh my gosh, I've been in it for so long. Um, I literally, when I go, I started, my first ATV conference was in the late 80s. So wow, have I seen some changes. But I'm passionate about this work because um, I love the analysis of, of, of a performance situation and then realizing all the many ways we can address it. And um, 
and, and helping people to help themselves to to become better at what they do. Um, Dana Robinson has written some really good things. She used to present at ATV all the time, and, and she had a thing called the Gap Zapper. So one page chart, and I don't know if you can Google it and get it or not, but it's in her books. If you look at Dana Gaines Robinson's in her books, and um, you know, training and development is only one solution to a performance problem. And this one page graphic really illustrated that. And I've used it so often um, because we can affect some of those other things too. Uh, we can help people figure out some of those other things. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's what I like is that our jobs just touch so many different areas. It touches the business, it touches people, and it, it's always something new and always something different you know, and the rewards are great with that. What else? Stella, I haven't heard from you today. Stella, what, why are you in this, this industry? Why do, what do you love? Uh, you have such an impact because if you produce videos and quizzes and everyone uh, has access to them without you being there, I think um, I'm, I'm one of the best known people of the company because of the e-learning courses for our distributors and um, daughter companies and subsidiaries. That's, that's fantastic to have such an outreach worldwide. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's when you talk about the movement of the industry, right? Before we were pretty siloed off and now the reach that we have yeah. is pretty impressive. So good for you, Stella. I love yeah, that. Everyone can produce videos with Camtasia and, uh, if they are well done, short and precise, then it's loved by everyone. That's great. It is great. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else before we call it a day? Bess? Had a feeling. Um, <laughs> You know, really, uh, really, it's about the opportunity to help people develop it, but doing that in a creative way that you engage them differently. Um, to Stella's comment, something sometimes it's good that everyone knows you, and sometimes it's not because, like, you're the person who made all that training. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, those are probably the key things. Yeah, I love the creative elements of what we do. All right, anyone want to do have the last yeah. the last word on this? I'll say one thing really quick, and that is just like they always say. That if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I love teaching. So it's something that it's been a passion for 45 years and I still can't stop. So it's just, I don't feel like I'm working. I don't, I really don't. So thank and you. I, everyone. I love today's uh, conversation. I didn't participate much, but I did listen the whole time. So, well, thank you for that. And I think that's the perfect place to end this conversation on. So thank you everyone for participating in today's coffee chat. So everybody, great weekend.